So as, as we start um, our presentation today, I just wanted to um, let everyone know that the goal of this talk is going to help cl clinicians become more familiar and confident when we're utilizing the hormone and ur urinary metabolite assessment profile, also known as the HUMAP. And I also want to thank everyone who submitted questions. You're going to see those come in the beginning of my talk and sprinkled throughout, and they really helped form what I am able to speak about today. So I wanted to start with a timeline of hormone testing evolution. Now, when you look back in time, um, as I was digging and trying to answer this question for a provider, it looks like um, I was surprised to learn that urinary testing was actually kind of the first on the block as far as looking at urinary hormones. Um, we see that in the 40s and 50s. We also see that technology has changed a little bit in the 60s, and we start to use more specific methods of um, hormone testing. We see that um, gas chromatography came on then. It was really complex. It took a lot for um, technicians to run that, and the cost kind of limited that to more specialty labs and larger institutions. Um, because of that, around the 1970s, serum testing became um, the major player, I would say. It began to take off. Um, it has some challenges, of course. Uh, we always think about serum testing. We have those binding proteins that we just can't do, um, get away from, but it's mainstream. It became the gold standard. And fast forward many decades later, we see that saliva testing started to ramp up in the 2000s, and at the, around the same time, um, you also see some new technology come on board, which is liquid chromatography and tandem mass spec. Now, this is different than the gas chromatography of the 40s and 50s. Um, and as technology advanced, this allowed for, again, more specificity for testing. Again, we see that that testing methods, the testing methods that we're going to use today, and we'll talk a little bit about, actually... Um, made it so that research could pick this up. And so a lot of the research that we see for metabolites aren't actually in the serum. We see a lot of urine coming. Um, we also, we do see serum um, and that is going to be in the um, liquid chromatography made that possible. So we move forward, if you're familiar with saliva testing, it continues to grow. And I was interested to see that Johns Hopkins University, as well as the University of California, also have institutes for salivary bioscience research. And so what we have today is a plethora of options as far as testing. So urine, um, saliva, and serum are all available. For a picture of why liquid chromatography and mass spec is a major advantage in the way we test hormones, this is this slide's just comparing it to amino assays that you'll see in um, both serum and saliva. You'll see that the major pro for this type of testing that we're going to be talking about today is it's extremely sensitive and specific to what we are looking for, um, as opposed to, you know, I think the con of you know, serum indoor saliva is the potential for some cross reactivity. So, and a great question about what is liquid chromatography and mass spec. Um, I know this slide is a little busy. I put a lot of words on there. It's gonna, it's a great explanation, but to just abbreviate what's here, this is a type of testing that allows for extremely specific and sensitive hormone measurements. And, um, it even is able to look in samples that contain similar substances. And we think about that um, for things like estrogens where they are just a little off from one another. Um, this is gonna allow us to even target that even more. So what are what does urinary testing actually look at? Well, there's two things. We're going to be looking at the unconjugated hormones and those are hormones like progesterone, testosterone, estradiol, the typical sex hormones that we think about, um, as well as conjugated metabolites. So when we are conjugating, um, we are just adding a little uh, water-soluble arm. We think about this, um, we'll talk about hydroxy metabolites. Those are examples of conjugated metabolites. 
And what that does is just makes it available to be extruded and the urine or stool. So in comparing doctor's data saliva testing to hormone testing, there are some advantages to each of the tests. And I would say, um, really, these are just two separate sets of information for the same hormone story. In saliva testing, we measure bioavailable, so that's the unbound portion of the sex hormone. We can also look at and monitor routes um, of administration for BHRT. And it's the only effective method to accurately measure those topicals, transvaginals, rectal suppositories, uh, and sublinguals. And we're gonna look and see um, because of that unique transport in the body that they have. Now, when we look in urine, this is again, the unconjugated and conjugated metabolite. So urinary testing is essentially measuring what the body is clearing. And this is the best way to measure those hormone metabolites due to the sensitivity of the um, technology that we have just talked about. Within the industry, there are a few hormones and metabolites that aren't able to be tested with other labs. So because of our instruments and their sensitivity, we're able to measure some of those. And for example, we're able to measure progesterone itself. Um, as well as its metabolites. And some uh, labs will measure metabolites and add these together to give an estimation of progesterone, which is one way to do it. But I like having the unconjugated um, and conjugated forms of hormones when we look. We also see that um, we have the ability to measure not only DHEAS, but DHEA. Allopregnanolone, which is gonna be another area we'll highlight in the progesterone section. Androstenedione, and uh, we also are able to include um, metabolites of estradiol. Most, um, I would say other labs are looking just at the estrone metabolites. And I think we're missing a lot of the picture if we're just looking um, at estrone and not also estradiol. Another advantage of the HEMAP is its collection. So this is a liquid urine collection, um, also for enhanced sensitivity, especially for those low concentrated metabolites. When we think about other testing or um, dried urine, for example, that has to be reconstituted from that filter paper once the sample arrives. And that reconstitution could lead to a loss of those polar steroid molecules. Um, and then, you know, thinking about having to correct for creatinine in some of those patient samples. Also, when you have a liquid urine sample, it can be shipped after frozen for four to six hours. So uh, typically a faster processing time um, and um, ability to detect those low concentrated metabolites. This question also came in and there is a past wellness Wednesday lecture from um, this year devoted to the topic of comparing all of these mediums. So I you know, took this, this clip from that. Um, the answer to this question is tricky. So ultimately, you know, practitioners can do what they would like with their clinical practice. But I think understanding a little bit about how exogenous hormones behave in the urine with different, top, with different applications um, can also help practitioners choose if, uh, which way they want to monitor um, their hormone prescription. So let's talk about this for urine testing. It's a little bit different than you might be used to with other methods. Um, when we have oral supplementation, levels are overestimated. So what we can see is oral delivery comes and creates conjug um, conjugates in two places. First, we'll think about the gut and then the liver. So this causes urinary metabolites to raise um, higher than tissue levels. I would say, you know, it might not be the ideal for monitoring dosage. Um, it could give you some indication of how things are moving through. When we look at topicals, a lot of people are on topicals. We'll see that um, urine hormone testing does not reflect tissue uptake of those topical hormones. So, you know, typically saliva might be a better place to monitor that. But if we are using urine, just remember that topical levels are typically underestimated.
And then thinking about you know vaginal applications. For urine testing, this is, I would say, not recommended, and that's because of contamination of the urine samples. Um, if someone is on vaginal hormones, we do ask that they hold for about 72 hours prior to testing just to try to eliminate um, contamination there. Sublinguals um, aren't subject to first-pass metabolism, so typically this form of supplementation, it's not likely to increase um, in the urine as far as the hormone metabolites go. However, indefinitely, we're going to have some hormone be swallowed. Um, so we have, we'll have a little uptick in some metabolites. Um, this is why it's recommended to avoid that for about 72 hours prior to collection. And finally, when we're thinking about prescribing and urinary testing, injectable pellets, um, injectables or pellets, those are hormones that passed through the portal circulation. So you're gonna see a steadier increase in hormone levels. Um, and I think that could potentially be reflected in urine. Um, however, these are still excreted hormones. So you're not seeing tissue levels, but what the body body is utilizing. You know, I think that, um, you know, thinking, changing our thinking a little bit about what we're actually testing. And we do wanna collect that in between the midpoint with each dose. Okay, now let's look at and dive into the report itself. Okay, so this is the first page of the HUMAP. It does look a little bit busy, but that's because, you know, we wanted to provide you with the most information and I wanted to give some highlights that most um, clinicians are looking for and really the actionable steps here. You can see it all on the first page. Um, I know that providers, like myself have very little time. So sometimes I am able to just look at this front page and along with the second page, which I'll show you as well. And you can gain a lot of information before um, going into the case or even having to dive deeper into this report. Let's look at the sections here. The first page, the dark blue is gonna indicate markers that are um, below range. So we're color coded here, and that's going to be for an at a glance. So once we get used to that color coding, it's going to make this a lot easier. We have red on the opposite spectrum, and that's going to indicate values that are elevated or abundant. Um, when we look at what's within range, we'll typically see the lighter blue, green, and yellow are all within range. Just for functional reasons, we will call out the bottom and top percentages of the ranges. Um, so we'll see a low range and an upper range there. Now I wanted to share with you that on this um, arc or half moon shape that you see here, um, this placement will be, the, the analytes here aren't going to change. So these are going to be standard. It's what most practitioners wanted to look for. Um, you will see estradiol, estrone, estriol. We also will have a ratio of the 4-OH E1 to 2 metabolites. Progesterone, alpha and beta pregnanolone, allopregnanolone, DHEA plus DHES, testosterone, 5-alpha reductase, cortisol for the day, cortisone for the day, and metabolized cortisol. Um, and we also have a marker 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, which we'll dive into, but it gives us a little information about oxidation. You can also see that there's a little letter next to each little one, and that will tell you which part of the report to look into um, if you have things that are interesting for you to look at. So this slide, this will change. Here you can see the same 15 analytes and how this arc might look different for each patient. Now, also on the front page, there's an estrogen section. And from the summary page, we like to highlight the two, the four, and the 16 OH metabolites, and as well as how they are being methylated. So you can kind of get a snapshot of that all in one area. Here you see an abundance of methylation activity. You can also see some things are um, outside of the range as far as percentages. Here's an example of, of how these can change. So um, we will look at you know, both the E1 and the E2 metabolites, and you can see that 
there can be some differences within that. Um, so it's nice to have that highlighted on the first page so you know what you're looking for, as well as methylation activity. It can you know, be different for either side. And it's nice to just have a glimpse at what that might look like. Here's an example of some things that are, you know, um, lack of abundance are a little bit low. And you can see some things are also outside the reference ranges as far as percentages. So these are going to change um, based on patient results. The next thing to highlight is going to be the corticoid section. Cortisol and cortisone are plotted together for some quick information about the relationship to one another, how their, you know, how their curve correlates. Um, Cortisol is that solid line and cortisone is the dotted line, but you can see um, that the dial on the left, this patient is favoring more cortisol. Another highlighted section and things we're gonna dive into in this talk, you're going to see um, the ability to look at um, enzyme activity. So 5 alpha reductase will be highlighted, aromatase, and then again, we'll look at the methylation activity. Okay, so page two of the report, don't get overwhelmed. Page two of the report shows the entire steroid hormone cascade. Now this just isn't a steroid hormone cascade. Um, it is a dynamic steroid hormone cascade. So this is your actual patient results. It's color coded and you can see at a glance where markers might be a little low or high um, can help you kind of target information if you wanna dive deeper into the report. I also think this is fun to show patients um, and circle for areas that we're working on and you know they can be kind of see a part of their of their um, treatment plan as well as your clinical thinking. Here we see you know the dynamic nature of this test. It is remember the color coding will be throughout this test. It is going to change for your patient. I'm gonna caution everyone not to get wrapped up into fixing every analyte that may be out of the expected reference range. That's actually not the purpose of this test. Rather, it's to take a step back and look at more of the report as a whole. Now that we've taken a step back, think about this um, dynamic steroid hormone cascade. I, I like the image of a river where things are flowing, are there blockages? Could there be a dam, um, faster or slower points? These are the types of questions that we should ask ourselves when we're utilizing this report um, with this uh, vast amount of information. We're gonna explore these ideas as we move forward. Okay, so we can divide this into several neighborhoods. We have four. We'll look at these sections individual, progesterone. We'll look at the corticoid section, androgens, as well as the estrogens. Well, first up, we're gonna think about progesterone neighborhood. First, we have the ability to look at progesterone itself. I think looking at conjugated hormones with the body, you know, is getting unconjugated hormones that the body is getting rid of can give you an idea of flow patterns. It also can um, be confirmatory as we look at then metabolites of progesterone. We can see 5-alpha and 5-beta pregnandiol. Those are the major metabolites of this um, of progesterone. You know, typically, we see that the beta pathway is favored in, in the majority of the population. However, we can also look and see about alpha modulation here. We also have the ability to test allopregnanolone, which I find pretty helpful as far as, you know, thinking about a clinical picture or um, thinking about how supplementation might work for a patient. So if, you know, someone already has a high, higher allopregnanolone or maybe it's low, would supplementation work for them? Could we push that pathway? That's how I would think about using this test in the progesterone section. But so we know that allopregnanolone crosses the blood brain barrier and it binds the GABA receptor. And that's what typically gives patients those nice sleepy like effects when they are supplementing. So this will be the major metabolite we should see with supplementation. 
And again, I think this can probably help monitor um, the oral progesterone metabolism if we're supplementing. Now in urine, remember that we are tracking more of the movement of the hormone um, prescription as opposed to dialing in a dosage here, but understanding again that oral progesterone supplementation, it's gonna generate a lot of metabolites. So if we're gonna test it and look for it, just expect that there's gonna be more metabolites there. Um, when we think about transdermal progesterone, how would that show up in a test? Remember that tends to be underestimated as this you know, typically goes to the tissues first before being metabolized, but you might be able to see downstream metabolite effect and rise as far as um, those, those two um, routes of administration. So in addition, I, I would say, in addition to the lab findings on the right, um, for women that are postmenopausal who are also supplementing, I wanted to point out that we do provide reference ranges for um, the premenopausal uh, woman. And that can also give a practitioner an idea of where they're falling as far as um, supplementation going is going or assessing uh, treatment strategy. Feel like progesterone was the appropriate place to ask this question. Um, is there any utility in testing patients on contraceptives? This is tricky. I said potentially, but there are some things that we need to know first before we can make this um, decision. First, we know that the mechanism of action of oral contraceptives is gonna be the suppression of FSH and LH to decrease estrogen and prevent ovulation. So with that in mind, this is gonna to lead to a decreased production of both estrogen and progesterone. Um, so typically you'll also see the metabolites of those um, unconjugated hormones might be a little bit lower. It's interesting that you know, cortisol metabolism could also be affected by oral contraceptive use. Um, there are several studies that suggest that it can increase the circulating binding protein for cortisol, and that can also um, decrease the total uh, cortisol concentrations, again, as well as the metabolites. It seems that progestin only and low dose estrogen um, therapies have less effect on cortisol levels in the plasma and saliva, but it really hasn't been studied in the urine. So ultimately, I would say the choice is up to a provider if they want to test on oral contraceptives. You know, think about your end goal. Is it to show suppression throughout, throughout the hormone cascade to your patient? If so, this, this might be helpful. Um, but typically, I don't, I'm not recommending you know, this type of testing or even you know, saliva testing for saliva hormone testing for um, patients on oral contraceptives. Okay, and with that, we're gonna switch over to cortisol and see how we might be able to use that clinically. There are about three areas in the cortisol section, corticoid section that I typically think about, and we'll, we're gonna dive into these, but do we have um, cortisol cortisone? What does the metabolized cortisol look like? Tell me about cortisol versus cortisone metabolites. So which one are we favoring? We'll move through this and I'll give a little bit of an explanation. So when we think about 11 beta HSD enzyme, it's really telling us what is happening at the level of the kidney. So most of the activation, deactivation of the kidneys is happening in the kidney. So Cortisol is the active form, where cortisone is more of the storage form. So 11-beta-HSD1, that's going to be actively pulling out cortisol from storage. Typically, we think about this with obesity, metabolic syndrome, um, inflammation, sometimes even, you know, has to do with uh, thyroid function. The HSD2 protects the mineral corticoid receptor from aldosterone effects, but this this is um, the enzyme that will put cortisol in storage or create cortisone. 
Um, and, and that's going to protect against, you know, hypertension, maybe even some retention of fluids and those kinds of things that long-term cortisol could, could create if we didn't have this enzyme to help buffer that in the system. So because we are looking at more of the influence of the kidney, when we're thinking about this enzyme, we aren't necessarily seeing HPA axis activity directly, but rather what the body's response to cortisol levels are. You know, so what is the body choosing to do with cortisol at that time? The other area you want to look at is metabolized cortisol. So this is a measurement of what the body has utilized. And it's a total um, pool from what's happening with cortisol and cortisone. What we typically see is, you know, high metabolized cortisol, we see that with increased cortisol clearance due to overproduction of cortisol. We see that with obesity, insulin resistance, inflammation, and even in hyperthyroidism. So the opposite, when we think about low metabolized cortisol, this is a decreased cortisol clearance, which could also be due to obesity and inflammation and insulin resistance. You see how that can also, that can affect um, either high or low and then hypothyroidism. So this gives us, again, what the body has utilized, what it is done with and is, is moving through. When we look at the cortisol versus cortisone metabolites, this is gonna give us a metabolic preference. So this is gonna tell um, you know, the clinician which one is our body favoring. Do we have a predominance for cortisol or are we leaning more towards cortisone? Again, let me just sum that up because I know sometimes it can be confusing. When we're looking at the unconjugated hormones, cortisol and cortisone, we're really looking at that 11 beta HSD activity. And that's going to tell us if the body is activating or deactivating cortisol. When we look at metabolized cortisol, this is going to be a measurement of what the body has utilized. When we think about cortisol versus the cortisone metabolites, this is going to give us the metabolic preference for one or the other. Okay, let's move on to the androgen neighborhood. Now this, this is a, a wildly complex area, I would say probably has the most analytes um, in, in a little section. It gives us a, a lot of information. So what we're gonna see is our ability to look at enzyme activity, We'll talk about two that are really important here. So uh, five alpha reductase, we're also gonna see aromatase. We'll be able to monitor the activity of testosterone metabolites, thinking about five alpha DHT. Also metabolism of five alpha versus five beta. We'll think about DHA and DGS. And then possibly how, it, how could we use this clinically? We'll think about cases of um, PCOS. I also think about, you know, prostate cases, or you could, you know, even look at, we'll see further, um, you could even look at what's happening with some of the prescribing that you have in your male patients as well. How is that moving through? So aromatase is an enzyme that converts androstenedione to estrone and testosterone to estradiol. I would say um, this is probably the most well-known enzyme here. Um, there's many polymorphisms can happen. So just take that into account. Um, we, but we do see that it can also be activated um, for carcinogenic reasons. Um, PCBs are going to affect this as well. So typically we're thinking about how to um, in decrease, but this is the kind of the causes, right? So um, most people know this. This is the story of you know andropause and menopause. Um, basically, testosterone levels convert to estrogen, and we have more adipose tissue around the abdomen. And that's going to increase aromatase and inflammatory cytokines, and it's all exacerbated by things like you know alcohol and pizza and ice cream and stress. So this is one that you know, we're we're probably clinically already thinking about in, in our practice. 
Now, when it comes to androgens, I found it interesting that um, the research has shown having higher levels of testosterone can lead to certain types of cancer. However, um, and here we're looking at breast cancer. However, when you dive into the research, what they have actually found is that it's not testosterone. So it's not actual androgen that leads to the cancer, but it's the aromatization of testosterone that increases those proliferative effects. So thinking about risk management, I would say having higher aromatase can lead to you know, further um, issues in the future. In general, you want to downregulate this enzyme. Um, here's some things to support. We'll think about zinc and chrysin, Damiana, um, grape seed extract, nettles. Um, those are gonna you know, increase testosterone without uh, and inhibit the conversion to estradiol. Also things that can reduce inflammation. Um, we'll make this list here as well as some medications. Okay, and so here we see 5 alpha reductase. I've highlighted where it is on, on the cascade there. We'll see, we can see that in a couple of places. Um, now I would say the biggest part of this enzyme is gonna take testosterone and form it into um, more potent DHT. So it's, it's about two to three times affinity for that androgen receptor. So it, it binds pretty tightly and it is more androgenic. I would say in um, females, sometimes you'll see things like you know, scalp hair loss and, and acne develop. This is gonna be something to monitor for those androgenic symptoms. You'll be able to um, look on either side and again, the front page to see is 5-alpha reductase um, or, or do we have a preference for that? Now, to downregulate our 5-alpha reductase, here's some things to think about like salpometo and nettles and pygm. Um, it's important to point out though that when we're using these therapies, you know, nothing exists in a vacuum. So we do have other areas that we actually will show on this testing as well, but there are other pathways that are gonna utilize 5-alpha reductase. So sometimes it's great to see the whole picture and see if you're truly favoring that 5-alpha pathway. You know, and to um, do that in the androgen section, we're looking at 5-alpha and 5-beta metabolism here. But androsterone, and that is the 5-alpha, and then etiocholanolone, which is the beta metabolism. So again, alpha is probably going to give you more of those androgenic symptoms where, you know, the beta pathway generally produces less of those, those androgenic symptoms. There's a couple of other smaller metabolites here that can, can back up your story about alpha versus beta metabolism. And of course, utilizing other neighborhoods to um, see the totality of that 5-alpha influence if it's there. Now, this is a little, um, this, is, this is interesting and I would say, you know, unique to doctor's data. Um, we have the ability to measure DHEA, DHEAS. We also have a marker of adding DHEA and DHEAS together. When I think of DHEA, you know, it's a pro-hormone. I, I think about it as potential, right? So it has the ability to increase both androgens as well as estrogens. So it's an important piece of that hormone story. You see, DHEA is the active form while DHEAS is the inactive form. So potentially adding these together, it's gonna give the practitioner a better idea of the total pool of what's available. Again, what's the potential for this pro hormone. All right, so I'm gonna show you a little, little case here. So this is a case of a 15 year old female with PCOS. Note the elevated DHEA, we're gonna see some androgens, right? Testosterone elevated, as well as the metabolites, you know, five alpha androstenedione, you're gonna see androsterone is elevated, they seem to be, you know, favoring this 5-alpha reductase pathway a little bit. Um, so definitely utilizing urinary testing in this case helped to elucidate the total impact of the estrogen or the androgens on this female and give some peace of mind regarding those androgenic symptoms that she was feeling. 
else is going to ultimately help, you know, guide treatment? Do we think about, you know, androgen um, suppression in this case? With base, baseline testing like this, I think it behooves us to do that because it's going to help us track treatment over time. So we'll be able to see what the body is getting rid of, um, baseline here, and then utilizing strategies and seeing where we're able to um, get in the future. Now, of course, we'll um, have, of course, we have individuals who are utilizing testosterone prescriptions. And I think that can be very helpful to just see how it's metabolizing out, you know, not so much as guiding dosage, I would say. Um, remember, we talked about transdermal, but that's going to be underestimated typically in, um, in the tissues, and then we'll see that metabolites are underestimated. But injections and pellets seem to be the way to go if, as far as utilizing urinary testing. You might be able to see that better than any other form um, on this test. Now, I'll show you a little example of a patient on a very high dose of testosterone gel. This is about 100 milligrams daily, so super physiologic dosing here. And again, Remember that we generally um, see little evidence of topically applied hormones in the urine, but this is um, enough so it's spilling over in massive quantities. You'll see that every little area here is kind of lit up in the pathway. There's definitely some alpha metabolism um, preference here. We also had, a, sorry, I apologize, I didn't include it, but there is some aromatization happening. It's very active here. And so this is, I would say, a great example of you know, if you know if someone is just being massively overdosed, um, this, this type of testing um, for transdermal anyway would, would give you a clue um, and maybe be able to help you convince your patient to think about what's happening in their body and or change your treatment plan a little bit. Okay, so we've finished the androgen section. I wanted to just summarize things that we have talked about so we can get an idea of, you know, thinking about the unconjugated hormones. This is going to give us um, our starting material. This is a pool that we can draw from. It's going to be the starting of our story. <clears throat> then we're going to think about evaluating alpha versus beta preference. You know, do we have those more androgenic symptoms? Are we um, pushing pathways that can lead to those androgenic symptoms? And then also remember those two enzymes that are really important, 5-alpha reductase and aromatase. <clears throat> the most well-researched neighborhood, I would say, in, as far as metabolite go, is definitely going to be the estrogen neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> while the unconjugated hormones are an important part of the picture, E1, E2, and E3, there are only really a small part of the hormone story. And the real fun begins you know, when we can see how the body is utilizing these hormones. So we'll look at utilization and phase one and phase two metabolism. We'll also think about what's happening with methylation an evaluation of you know, potential risk when we think about DNA mutagenesis. And then um, you know, this could be also a possibility to um, evaluate metabolism of both endogenous and potentially exogenous hormones. So seeing how they're moving through. Again, we have aromatase. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here because we've previously seen aromatase in the androgens, but just know that we have the ability to kind of see how it's also influencing the estrogens on one test. This might also, if you have erroneously um, abundant estrogens, this might also give you an idea of where that's coming from. Typically, we see this elevated in peripheral fat, and it happens, you know, aromatization will occur in both men and women. I took a snippet from the front page, and you can see in the aromatase activity, you know, you'll, you'll see this dial, and it will move back and forth as far as, you know, increased or decreased metabolism for, of this enzyme. So we're gonna talk about the estrogen metabolism. We have to talk a little bit about phase one and phase two detoxification. I don't wanna spend a lot of time here, but I do wanna highlight that, you know, phase one detoxification is doing way more in our body than just, you know, eliminating estrogens. Uh, we also will see besides steroid hormones, antibiotics, xenobiotics, pharmaceuticals, there's a plethora of things that will um, 
be moving through phase one metabolism. So I would say ultimate biological effect of, of the estrogens is going to um, depend on how it's metabolized. So we see this primarily happening in the liver. And here are some cofactors. I included this slide so that you can think about some cofactors to support these one. And I'm going to talk more about this process, but this is, you know, phase one as a whole. When we just look at the estrogens in phase one, this is where hydroxylation is happening. So these estrogens are typically known as the catechol estrogens or hydroxy estrogens. Um, there will be three that we will talk about. Each one has its own special little enzyme that helps create it. And each one has its own risk profile. So 2OH in the research would say it tends to be the safer estrogen. It looks, um, we're going to be looking at CYP1A1 when we're thinking about modulation. 4OH tends to lead to a little bit more DNA damage. We'll think about CYP1B1, so that's more potentially harmful. And 16OH kind of lives in this gray area. It can potentiate DNA damage. Um, so, you know, maybe not as safe as 2OH here. Um, and that will be a metabolized by CYP3A4. So this is an enzyme that you'll want to take note of. And this is the one that pushes estrogen towards that safer catechol estrogen um, in phase one. So it's 2OH. We want estrogen to move in that direction. So not in the 4OH pathway. You know, I, I put on here, it's interesting that we also have to be mindful that other toxins are moving through the system and turning into even more dangerous intermediates. So things like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, those are gonna be, that are cancer promoting. We also see that this enzyme activates aflatoxin B1 and tobacco intermediates, both of which are carcinogenic. Um, so we still need to ensure that these metabolites are gonna complete the story um, and don't get stuck in phase two and phase three. But this tends to be the safer of the metabolites. I've left some how to upregulate here. You'll see that cruciferous vegetables, rosemary, resveratrol, and green and black tea are going to be helpful. Here's some examples of what might downregulate. And typically, it's going to be more um, toxin, toxic kind of things, charred meats, that kind of thing. But you'll also see some natural products here that can be a little confusing. Um, I would say that, you know, body has some wisdom to upregulate and downregulate. So you, there is a little bit of a gray area as far as, you know, what might downregulate it as that could also upregulate it. So there are a couple things on this list that will have some crossover. Now, when we look at CYP1B1, we'll see that. Um, that takes estrogen down that 4-OH pathway. It's more readily found in tumor tissues. It can activate, you know, more cancer-promoting um, compounds. And so typically, you know, we're, we're wanting to avoid this pathway. But this can be upregulated by um, things like leptin resistance or inflammation or insulin resistance. So if you have a, a patient who has those things already going on, Understanding, you know, estrogen metabolism is probably the way to go. To downregulate this enzyme, we'll think about things like resveratrol, you know, anything in the ABAC family, really, uh, lycopene. There's a lot of research out there. Um, I've included the PubMed IDs for everyone. I didn't want to have to dive into all the research, but I have it here for you. Now, when we're thinking about 16-OH, we'll think about CYP3A4. This is gonna move estradiol to estriol, as well as estrone to our 16 pathway here. I would say the activity of this enzyme varies and it can be affected by things in, in your environment and your overall health, hormones, and genetics. Um, it's mostly found in the liver. It's pretty active in the gut, but there are, um, I would say internal compounds that 
Um, it may also metabolize like cholesterol and fatty acids. So these are, again, it's kind of a gray area. There are some good things, positive things that this is doing as well. When we think about upregulating, this is going to be St. John's wort, you know, valerian, vitamin D, um, those kinds of things. Many polyphenols, including flavonoids and phytoestrogens, uh, tannin, sulforaphane, ginseng. There's so many ways to you know, help modulate this pathway. Now, when we think about um, phase two detoxification, this is all about water solubility. This is about taking that you know, potential, um, still a little bit reactive OH and making it more water soluble so it can leave the body and um, be safely removed. 2-H and 4-OH um, estrogen metabolites, again, are further, you know, moving into phase two. We see that there are these reactive oxygen intermediates that can come from the phase two reactants. And we're gonna think about that a little bit as we move forward. Um, you know, typically when I'm thinking about phase two de detoxification, in my mind, I think, you know, are we oxidizing or are we methylating? So methylation, this is going to be our best friend. This is uh, the COMT enzyme, and it inactivates those catechol estrogens, so it increases the solubility. Um, it also makes these safe to leave the body. So once they are um, methoxy metabolites, they can safely exit without further harm. We also see, you know, on the other side, oxidation. So what happens in oxidation is we have um, a peroxidase, and that typically will lead to um, quinone or semi-quinone formation. And that's gonna be dangerous, I would say, for the body as far as you know, carcinogenic potential. So you know, what we see is that COMT really is our friendly character in this story. And once COMT works its magic and is methylated, these two, you know, 4-OH and um, 2-OH are both gonna be methylated and activated. Now, there are a couple of areas that you will see on the report itself that will give you an idea of methylation potential. So first, we'll see that on the summary page. Now, I want to point out that this is just looking at the metabolites of estrone here, the two and the four of estrone, which is helpful. It kind of gives you a little at the glance. But what you also might want to do is flip back into the estrogen section and get an idea of the four areas where you can measure the methylation potential. So that's going to be in the two and the four pathway for both estrone as well as estradiol. So really, there are four areas to focus on. And I would say clinically, most of the time when you're looking at this, you know, it's not all the way across the board. So you can see where some individuals might be struggling um, in areas. If you were only looking at E1, you are potentially gonna be missing some of the um, picture of the methylation activity. Here's some ways to support methylation, is also with foods and or cofactors and methyl donors. I'm sure there's more things to think about here, but I wanted to give you um, a list to kind of get you started. Things to think about for patients when you're consulting for, um, you know, whether it's diet and lifestyle, what we see is, you know, high sugary diets tend to be a big focus um, for inhibiting methylation, leptin resistance, of course. Um, also, remember those vitamin cofactors, so deficiencies in, in vitamins as well. We also see bisphenols and PCBs. Those are going to play a role as well as, you know, PPIs, even antibiotics can decrease um, methylation cofactors here. This is a little snippet of why we want to methylate. Here's a, an image that's showing, you know, what's actually occurring as far as quinones and semiquinones. So they're not just words. You can see some pictures here. And those can be, both the quinones and semiquinones can lead um, to DNA damage, um, we'll see the end result of some stable and unstable um, DNA addicts, so holes within our, in our DNA. And I wanted to remind everyone that this is common to have SNPs in the COMT enzyme. Um, it's 
really common. So um, it's another reason that we need to be critical and understanding how our estrogens are being metabolized here. You know, we see some research for, um, for breast cancer with that, with those effects. And again, you know, thinking about those quinones in breast cancer, I, I wanted to give you a little more research to back up um, what we're seeing, but basically, the take-home point here is that increased amounts of estrogen DNA addicts are found not only in people with several different types of cancers, but also in women and women of high risk for breast cancer. So it's indicating that the formation of addicts is on a pathway to cancer initiation. Oh, I don't want to be all doom and gloom with that, but there are some things that we can do. So um, there are two, I, I would say the most research Supplements in this area are going to be NAC and resveratrol. So we'll see reduced estrogen um, semiquinones back to those catechol estrogens with NAC. So it's pretty interesting. And it actually reacts with those quinones and conjugates to, perform, uh, to prevent the formation of those addicts. So that's great to have on board. Resveratrol works in a similar way where it reduces the catechol estrogens back um, sorry, the semi-quinones back to those catechol estrogens. Um, and it's also protective, um, but we'll see that it will modulate CYP1B1. And by modulating that, you'll also see a reduction in the activity of this, this um, 4-OH metabolites. So potentially even turning the clock back a little further. Um, and, and you'll see that if you go back through the presentation, uh, these two are listed several times when we're thinking about the estrogen section. Okay, a really quick summary here. Evaluation of unconjugated hormones. We'll think about E1 and E2. That's, that's our starting material, right? That's what the body is clearing, of, getting rid of, and it's our pool. Uh, we'll think about aromatase activity. So are we having some influence of the androgens onto the estrogens? And then let's, you know, thinking about risk assessment, we'll think about our, um, are we pushing safer pathways or are there riskier pathways? And then methylation activity. So those are the big areas to highlight when we're looking at this test. Okay, we also are looking at 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine. This is not an estrogen metabolite. It does pair nicely with this information. Um, it's a marker for DNA damage due to oxidative stress. And that's in general not just you know coming from damage that we might see from metabolites, although that is what and how I want to think about it with this test. Um, there is extensive experimental evidence that oxidative damage permanently occurs to lipids of those cellular membranes and proteins. So what we see in nuclear and mitochondrial DNA is that 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine is one of those predominant forms of free radical um, induced oxidative lesions. So we're actually, you know, measuring the effects of that stress. Honestly, I don't think there's a human alive that doesn't have some sort of oxidative stress lingering around, but patients that typically have some of these conditions, you might see higher levels of 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine um, on your report. Um, and I would say, you know, the best thing for treatment for any elevations or abundance is going to be thinking about how to address the cause of oxidative stress. So that's going to be, you know, any of our antioxidants, you're going to think about, you know, NAC, anything you can do to address the cause of the stress in general. Okay. We're almost done. Uh, before I, we wrap up, I wanted to say that this, um, this report is complicated and it is color coded for quick interpretation. Um, however, since you know consulting and, and having this test myself, there are instances where we would see low levels as well as high levels as positive findings. So I think we need to retrain our clinical brain to see these colors in a different way. Thinking about red being um, not bad, let's think about red as being abundance. So I have abundance, how is it moving through? What is our river storytelling us? The same thing with blue. So the blue doesn't equal bad, you know, 
we tend to think, oh, low, we need to elevate it. Lou is saying, I have a lack of abundance. So, you know, again, looking at the rest of the river to see what the story is. Here's some examples of when red is a positive finding, right? So we have abundance of 2OH E1 or E2 or the percentage of 2OH or the ratio of 2 to 16 is even um, abundant. You know, we see that that 2OH is favorable for breast health. So we want that. You know, we also see some beta metabolism. You know, abundance could be a positive thing. We're not pushing the more... Um, I would say androgenic pathways in some cases, right? So those, those can be positive. Here's some examples of when that blue or what we typically think about low um, is, and this is more of a lack of abundance. So if you see a blue 4-OH-E1 or 4-OH-E2, you know, don't think that we need to raise it. That's actually a positive finding. It's, um, you know, the lack of abundance in that pathway is positive as well as 4-OH-E1. We think about you know, the relationship from five alpha to five beta. If we have a you know lack of abundance as far as the alpha pathway, for some individuals, this can be a positive finding. And the same thing, you know, alpha versus beta in the in the um, cortisol, cort, corticoid section, that can also be a positive finding. Okay. So it's going to wrap up by trying to summate what we've just discussed. You know, it's a liquid sample, the, the HUMAT profile, um, it's pretty easy to collect. It doesn't require reconstitution. We do have the ability to look at, you know, metabolites and hormones because our instrumentation is so specific. Um, we're gonna be able to have that comprehensive assessment. This test is gonna actually tell a practitioner what the body has utilized, giving greater insight into alpha versus beta metabolism, thinking about phase one and phase two detoxification, methylation activity, as well as potential risk assessment for breath, breast health or other diseases. And um, it's gonna give us an idea potentially of how the body is utilizing hormones, both endogenous and exogenous. Um, I think about urinary hormone testing also for those complex cases where, you know, BHRT and, um, you know, salivary testing appear to be normal, but the patient may still have symptoms. So I think um, this test has a lot of utility as far as um, what we're able to see as practitioners. It's really cutting edge and I'm excited for you all. I am, I think that's it for me. I am ready for some questions if there are any.